Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Uh, Tracy, I think everyone sort of knows that in many cities, but definitely in New York City, there's sort of this weird, like, there's two simultaneous real estate problems yes. and they sort of complement each other in a weird way. Right. Okay. So rents are too high. Yes. There's a shortage of housing and we have a bunch of empty office buildings and there's a sort of obvious solution, which would be take all the empty office buildings and convert them into preferably affordable housing. And yet it seems to be very difficult to oh, do yeah, that. I thought it sounds super easy. Just like, oh, we're going to turn these offices into homes now. Just, just let live, everyone, just live let everyone in like an in. open plan trading floor or yeah, something. Yeah, it sounds nice. It sounds all put right. Up, you know, put up some walls so people People have some privacy. Okay, but on it, actually, this reminds me. When I was at university, I had a friend who lived in a warehouse in London, and oh, really? they built their walls yeah. out of cardboard to oh. segment it. <laughs> Hopefully, that's not what we're doing here. But on a serious note, there are a number of difficulties, it seems, in doing this. And, and there are sort of physical ones yeah. around the actual layout of these former office buildings. But there's also regulatory, right. financial. And I hear people talk about it in a sort of abstract manner. Yeah. But today, I think we're going to dive into them in a little bit more detail. Right. So it, it is, you know, we joked around, but it is, everyone says it is very difficult to convert an office into a residential uh, building. But again, you know, the opportunity is there, but we really understand like, what are the constraints? What are like the real physical constraints? And how big is the opportunity? Because in theory, like clearly more can be done, but like how much are we like moving, can this move the dial is like a really interesting question. Yeah, and the other thing I kind of struggle to understand is New York itself is a city with a long history of carving up older buildings True. into new types of apartments. True. And so I wonder why it seems to be so much more of an issue this time around. Well, I'm very excited because today we do in fact have the perfect guest. You know, lots of people have been talking about this question really, you know, since the pandemic struck, but uh, our current guest has been working on it for a long time since well before it was trendy to talk about. So the perfect guest, we're <laughs> gonna be speaking with Joey Kaleli. He's the managing director of the Van Barton Group which has been involved in the office to residential conversions for about a decade. So, uh, Joey, thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, what do you just, what do you do at the uh, Van Barton Group? So I'm within the asset management group, and uh, we oversee essentially the execution of the business plan once we acquire assets, okay. so different buildings. So I'm going to start very broad, but then hopefully we can sort of get more into like each one of these difficulties or problems. Mm. But what sure. are the constraints around converting office buildings to residential? Yeah, for starters, it's it's uh, the zoning. So is the building that you're looking at um, within a zoning zoning district that allows for it to be converted? OK, uh, that's number one. If that checks the box, there are um, essentially a whole list of, of things that you go through. And, and for me, and when I evaluate these, the structure um, and the light and air and the possibility of light and air and bringing that in to create residential units um, and ceiling heights. So on a, on a kind of concrete floor to the underside of the structure above, what is that height? And if that height is less than a certain distance, um, say if it's less than nine foot six or, or if it's nine feet, then once you factor in all of the MEPs, the mechanical systems that need to go in above. Is this like plumbing, plumbing electric? Plumbing, okay. sprinkler, yeah. electric, all of those things that need to go in the, the um, ceiling above. Yeah. Then you drop your ceiling down. And if that goes below eight feet, really, that, that makes it very difficult to do. Um, especially in New York, where you're not going to be able to market units that have a, a finished ceiling less than eight feet. So the ceiling height uh, after the zoning district is one of the most crucial. So let's say, okay, there's a building, it's in an area that can be zoned. Um, or theoretically, the zoning allows for the conversion. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone calls you up and say, uh, Joey, come check out this building. How long does it take for you to like size up whether it's even worth exploring further. You walk into the building and like, what are you looking for broadly and hoping to see on that first uh, that first walkthrough? Very quickly. Really? Within hours. Really? Yeah. You can go through it and see the the ceiling heights, okay. the depth of the floor plate, the, the actual you know floor plan um, and the depth of that and then the structure. Because if the depth is, is great and it yeah. works out, um, then you wouldn't need to do any structural reconfigurations. And the depth just means like, you know, like here we're in the Bloomberg uh, offices 
and we have this like huge newsroom, which is very nice, but like space in the middle of that would not make for a good unit because it would not be exposed to any windows. Correct, correct. You'd have to make uh, structural modifications right. to the building uh, to be able to make that happen. So I think one of your famous conversions is downtown 180 Water Street, and you solved that depth problem yep. by basically creating a sort of like inner atrium courtyard, yeah. is that right? Yeah, we, uh, we ended up cutting a 30 foot by 40 foot hole in the center of the building. Wow. Um, 20 something stories uh, went all the way and that created a, a courtyard essentially for light and air to come down on the inside. And then there were studios and, and two or three bedrooms that uh, had their bedrooms up against that. What was it that made that plausible? So, okay, so you see, wait, it's called the floor plate is yes, the term. And correct. this is like sort of, yeah, okay. So, you, so if we're on the sixth floor or seventh yeah. floor of a building, yeah. that's the that, the floor plate. The horizontal of slice yes, of the building. Exactly. So you, this, what, it was 180 Water Street? Correct. Okay, so 180 Water Street in its previous version did not have like a suitable floor plate, but you understood the that there was an opportunity to, to cut a hole in it. Correct. It um, it had a suitable floor plate at one point in time for oh. office use. Right. Right. Yeah. But, sure. But um, for residential, it did not. And um, in evaluating that, yeah, we came up with the plan of cutting that hole in the center. Can you just talk a little bit more about that hole cutting? Like, how yeah. did you sort of recognize that? Yes, it's only it's currently only capable for offices, but actually we can make the math work if we cut a giant hole down the center of a building. Talk a little bit about that evaluation. So. Uh, with with a lot of things, um, just about everything is possible, mm -hmm. but it would cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so you have to evaluate the structural modifications that it would take to create that, and ultimately what you're going to do with that building at the end of the day. Yeah. Create the res the residences. How much money you're going to get on the rent, and then eventually you know sell that building one day. Um, and so when you evaluate that, especially in that courtyard area, mm -hmm. what's the spacing of the column bays from column to column? And does it allow for enough space um, to be able to cut that in mm -hmm. without really cutting oh. out any other structural, structural steel columns supports, yeah. or, or, or supports? Which um, when we cut that out, we, we still had to reinforce the rest of the structure um, and, and do a, quite a bit of that. So when you're looking to convert an office building to apartments or something like that, how much of what you're looking to do is based on, I guess, um, people's preferences on where they live versus regulatory mm. requirements about, well, you have to have so many fire exits and you have to have this number of windows and that sort of thing. So we look at it, um, we look at it, Evan Barton, much differently in terms of you have to obviously look at the code requirements mm -hmm. and have to build that within your plan. But we take it much further in terms of, we have a little bit more of like a hospitality approach um, to our multifamily buildings, our residential buildings, in that we look at the entire life cycle of the day and the resident and really put ourselves in the shoes of the resident and not just in 2023, but in 2033 and beyond. Um, so we try and incorporate as much technology and um, components that set this building up so that it's very much marketable um, at every point in time. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, again, I'm thinking about finding the right contractor, the right construction company that even knows how to like cut a hole. <laughs> in the middle of a building, which seems tricky. Like I imagine that's yeah. not something that every construction company can do. Yes. But can you talk a little bit about like, who, how many entities out there that can do that? And then maybe like, all right, the costs in 2023 for that, I assume are really a lot higher than when you started on 180 Water Street, both due to inflation and supply chain constraints. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about sort of operational constraints of, okay, theoretically, yeah, this is a cut holeable building, but actually getting someone to do that? Yeah, um, you have to find the right team members. Um, and since we've been in this space for a while, we've kind of brought on board and continued to work with, for the majority of it, I'd say probably 70% of our team members are repeat team members. Um, so the, when you say team members, these are contractors. Say, yeah, contractors, and people you work with in some way. Oh, okay. Um, okay. You know, we, we have the vision and and know how to execute we bring on uh, our consultants and our other team members to really evaluate those nuts and bolts pieces of cutting the holes and doing those things um, and be the experts in their field 
and finding the experts uh, is difficult and it takes years to, to create that team mm. that you're comfortable with um, to cut a hole in a building and know that everything is going to go as planned. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the financing because all of this, you know, cutting mm -hmm. holes in the middle of buildings sounds very expensive. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like a lot of the office conversions are often aimed at a sort of premium mm. segment of residential. And this has been one of the criticisms. Yes. So how does that fit in with the decisions on whether or not to go ahead for these projects? Like, is it just a fact of life that you have to create more expensive apartments that are going to pay for this? Or could you do this on a more affordable basis? You could do it um, both ways, mm. right? Ultimately, it comes down to what your basis is in the building when you purchase it. Um, and if you have a low enough basis when you when you buy that on a per square foot basis and knowing you know, we've done this a while, we know what it'll take um, to convert a building. So if that basis is a, is a certain amount, we layer in the amount that it takes to convert it. And we know at the end of the day where we're going to end up on a per square foot basis and our all in basis. Um, and so you can determine based off of that initial basis, which way it really needs to go. So if the basis is, is a certain amount, um, say if it's, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars a foot, if, if you're buying a billion five hundred dollars a foot and it's going to cost you five hundred dollars to convert, you know, you're in a thousand a foot. Mm -hmm. That's a, a pretty hefty price today. Um, and so you know that you would have to get very high rents, market rate rents to be able to make that pencil. Um, if you're able to purchase the building at a much lower basis, it gives you much more flexibility. And then, you know, layer into it the need, in my opinion, for legislation mm. um, to be able to make that easier. And, and so then you can target different um, segments of the market. So it's not all at the luxury end of the of the spectrum. So oh. just on that basis, what is the, ex you mentioned legislation, and there, my understanding is there is, or maybe there was some tax credit support for doing these kind of conversions. Can you lay out, like, what would you expect to see in terms of government support for doing this at the moment? So as of now, there, there isn't any um, incentive. Um, but uh, you know there have been you know there were debates in in New York State legislature um, to incorporate some sort of a, a tax abatement um, as part of this, um, and for that tax abatement there would be a certain amount of units within that converted building that would be affordable. Mm. I think that's fantastic. We need that. That'll help the housing crisis, um, and that'll that'll target a market that that really needs that that housing. That is not there. Um, another end of it is the date. I don't know if you've heard about um, the date uh, within zoning being able to kind of convert buildings as of right. Um, mm. So downtown in the financial district, south of Murray Street, um, it was in the early 90s, they changed that date to 1977. Mm. So buildings in specific districts, um, south of Murray Street, that were built prior to 1977 you could convert those as of right completely to residential hmm. and it could be market rate here in midtown it's 1961. what is the basis of these dates like i don't quite understand like what's some of the intuition or logic but uh, behind some of these constraints it, it's it's very much arbitrary okay um, huh. and it, at that point in time um Yes, it worked to help alleviate some of the vacant office space um, in the financial district. But the way that that really needs to be, and, and um, the mayor's task force and, and others have been a proponent for, is changing that date to uh, 1990, for instance. If Why even have a date? Why not just say, so, all right, yeah, that's, if, that's exactly if, if, if the market yeah, says, you know, empty. like it's doable, and if the market would value this particular plot of land more as housing than as office, like what is the logic behind having a date? So there are a couple of things with that. Okay. One, um, they proposed in 1990 with a rolling date. So okay. then as, you know, in 2050, we don't have the same problem. And we're saying we need to change the date. Okay. So it always, always cycles out. But one thing within zoning and changing some of the districts, say in, uh, in Chelsea, um, some of the manufacturing areas, they're only zoned for manufacturing right now. An issue of just changing that to residential 
is do we and they need to study this and they really do and they need to put the time in on this and and i don't think it's a good idea just to flip the switch hmm. and allow for residential to go immediately without studying do we have enough schools and hospitals and markets okay all of those things are the components of why yeah um there is a date um in these areas interesting so just on the the idea of maybe getting more government support, more tax credits, a loosening of some of the restrictions. One of the criticisms that you hear in New York specifically is that property developers already make a lot of money. And while this might help on the housing front, alleviate the housing shortage, we're basically giving them even more money. What would be your response to that? Or how could you alleviate some of those concerns? Yeah, I, I think it's it's easier to say that from the outside looking in. Um, but ultimately, the the risk that we're taking on in converting these buildings and making these investments is our risk, and mm -hmm. we should get paid for that. Um, it's not to say. Is it a risk though in New York if you make a bunch of really nice <laughs> apartments? Like, surely it is always it is always a risk, okay. no matter what. And yes, New York is a fantastic market, and um, you know the best market in my opinion to to ever do this, um, because not only that you know we feel strongly, many people feel strongly about the market here, uh, and residential and multifamily. Um, so yes, it is it is a great market to do it, but there is still risk with it. Um, there are cost overruns that could potentially happen mm. in the conversion. Um, there are numerous operational things that could happen after the fact and, and during lease up and, and things like that. New product could come online and compete with you. Mm. Um, recessions could hit, other things could hit that could um, bring the prices down from when you started uh, the discussion of that project. Um, let's say you got the, you know, the legislator cooperated and changed the tax code and they moved up the dates and a bunch of other stuff happened that was sort of favorable from a policy perspective. Like, okay, how much do you think just office to resident in general could like move the dial in both directions? Because mm -hmm. that's sort of the big question here. And it sounds like, you know, you've done, you've done a handful of projects, um, but it, you know, they, it, it doesn't seem like it's a va a possibility everywhere and there are lots of buildings that as you say you can like walk in and say no this is not going to work so like how much is this in terms of when people talk about there being a crisis of office uh, you know people not going to the office etc like that um how much could it move the dial in your view it's it's going to be one um one piece of the puzzle it's not going to be the the solving piece okay you know, this won't um solve the housing crisis altogether but not many things on a on a broad brush will but doing these things will certainly help and will certainly get more units on the market how closely do you follow the sort of return to office headlines mm. like you know if you see a news article that says Jamie Dimon says everyone at JP Morgan should yeah. come in four days a week instead of three do you immediately start incorporating that into your like forecasts and expectations for rent no, but we, we follow it very closely. We also invest in uh, commercial office. We have, we have many office buildings in our portfolio. Um, so we follow that very closely. Here in, uh, here in New York City. Here in New York, um, also in San Francisco, um, Seattle, Los Angeles. Um, so, so we follow it very closely. Can you, can we take a minute to talk about some of those markets from an office, per, just a pure office perspective? Cause people are so gloomy on it. You know, if you look at the shares of the publicly traded proxies, I guess, for some of these markets, pretty down yeah. in the dumps. There, there are challenges. New York is, is, um, well ahead of many of the markets that I just mentioned. Um, and I think that it comes down to, you know, the, the city and, um, the administrations uh, within those cities and making sure that they drive that traffic um, to their central business districts. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for instance, San Francisco, it's, it's, you know, it's seen better days. Yes. Um, and uh, we're looking at a lot of different opportunities there where we could potentially convert because you have people out eating at restaurants. Mm. Um, there are places that are busy and packed and not all the offices are, are occupied right. though. Um, here in New York, um, we've seen that return. We've seen a lot of people um, come back into the office. Um, you know, we really saw the residential uh, uh, multifamily takeoff in, call it May of 2021. Um, that's when we really saw that trajectory. 
Um, and it's it's helped with all the uh, return to office and with Jamie Dimon saying, you know, four days a week or, or five days a week for managing directors. Um, and that's what we need. Mm. Um, this might be a slightly weird question, but I remember, you know, the other big crisis in commercial real estate was sort of post 2008 when you had the death of retail and mm. the dead malls yeah. all over America. And there was a move then to try to convert some of that space either to, you know, new community facilities, gyms and things like that, or in some cases residential. How successful, I know this isn't your area of expertise necessarily, but how successful were those efforts and what can they tell us about the current situation? Yeah, I think it, it's area dependent um, because some of those areas where um, you're able to uh, change a mall to more of an outdoor mall, put some uh, multifamily on top of, of those uh, retail shops and maybe some parking below it, that creates a whole new life cycle and a whole new area with um, entertainment, um, where you're living and then, you know, then you can bring in some office components too. Um, and so I think there are some, uh, clear distinctions that, that separate the two, but I think the whole idea of breathing life into these areas is the key. Hmm. And, and what we're doing downtown in our conversions is, is really breathing life into these buildings and neighborhoods. And once you do that and you bring, uh, people into those areas, then it just kickstarts everything else. It kickstarts the retailers. Yeah. And then, you know, even offices want to be there. I lived in the financial district for, uh, I think, four years from 2011 through 2015. And it was like picking up. But now when I go yeah. down there, like there's just like so much more and like right. on the seaport and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, it's like, the tin building. I was like, oh, man. yeah, it's really yeah. nice. And I was like, oh, man, I, I kind of wish I. <laughs> uh, no, I really like uh I mean, it was a good time. Um, can you talk a little bit about business and the constraints uh, in the pandemic high inflation period that we've experienced? Because again, as we talked about, you've been doing it a long time, but everyone who's done, doing any sort of construction in 2022, 2023 is probably seen headaches. Can you talk about those headaches and have they abated at all? Is, have they eased in any way? Yeah, I, I think we saw a run up of, of pricing um, and certainly in, in 2022, um, and a lot of time trying to, to get people um, uh, signed on with a contract. They were very busy. Um, they didn't necessarily have the time for this or that. And that, that kind of also goes back to building that team. Yeah, and right. Making sure that you have the repeat um, contractors or, or vendors. Um, but we certainly saw the increase in, in prices of things. Um, you also saw the the whole crisis with um, shipping containers and the yeah. price of those skyrocket. Did that? What did? How did that affect you? So uh, we actually had it around that same time as when we were purchasing our glass um, for 160 water, mm. the, the project that's currently um, being converted uh, to residential, and we we we're looking to s locally source as many products as possible, um, but we couldn't get this glass locally, so we needed to go to Spain. Um, and during that time, you know, uh, shipping containers were extremely expensive. It was hard to get things going. We also saw um, a trucker uh, strike um, in Spain. Um, so we had to per really remember the perfect storm era yes. of Odd Lots yes. episodes. That's like that. It was just, yeah. You know, you really have to um, go through every iteration yeah. and, and create backup plans. So we made sure that we had a private escort um, for our glass uh, to the docks and to make sure that it got on the containers. Uh, when it was supposed to and and to us um, because you have to follow every yeah. piece that closely because mm. uh, if not it could get lost in in things um, the same thing with our our generator mm. um, even though it was made in the midwest here in the u.s um, we had uh, weekly calls with uh, our contractors and the and the manufacturer um, because of parts being an issue and what goes into the generator. So we had to really press them and, and say, hey, we'll fly out there. We want to come out there. We want to visit the, the plant, um, make sure everything's on track. And it was that pressure that it really made sure that they understood that this was a very high, high priority for us. It's kind of crazy you have to go chasing generators in this day and age. But um, <laughs> yes. since you mentioned glass, I have to ask, what's the deal with windows in New York? Sorry, that went very Seinfeld all of a sudden. <laughs> what's, um, the deal? what's the deal with windows <laughs> in New York apartments? No, but this is one of my pet peeves about New York real estate, which is 
and I sort of alluded to this before, but you have a lot of tenement buildings that have been cut up into smaller apartments into these traditional railroad apartments. And the window is always at the end in the bedroom, which apparently is also required by legal statute. But my preference certainly as a renter would be if I'm going to choose one room in the apartment to not have a window, it would probably be the bedroom. Mm -hmm. So why, why is that? And would loosening those type yeah. of requirements help these conversions? Yes, it would help. Um, but I would say that the, well, I guess to paint upon who you ask, um, mm -hmm. it could hurt the quality of life mm -hmm. um, because the, the rules for light and air are there for a reason. And so that um, you know, the general population and residents aren't necessarily taken advantage of. I appreciate other that. people might have different but, opinions but, about bedroom windows. But yes, um, for instance, at 180 Water, we noticed that um, you know some of the the um, units that didn't have as much natural light as others went quicker because mm -hmm. people have a preference for uh, hmm. for less light in their apartment or in their bedroom mm. so that they could sleep better. And that's a lot of times in New York, people were just there to sleep and go out and explore the city. Um, but yes, because of, of the requirement for, for that. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I would, uh, I would. Uh, I, I mean, look, I, I would love windows in every room. I would like yeah. to make that clear. But if I'm going to choose, a lot of New York apartments have just one window. Yeah, but we do have um, the ability for like blackout shades, which mm. we incorporate a lot of times in our units. Oh yeah, that's that have nice. the sun drenched units, but we have the ability to have the blackout shades to help with that. Big fan of the blackout shades. Can we talk a little bit about financing? Yeah, and um, obviously, uh, you know, interest rates a lot higher this year than they were, uh, you know, say a year ago or certainly two years ago or certainly uh, pre-pandemic. Um, what are, who is financing this and how much is, you know, it's sort of this perverse situation. And we've talked about it just with residential real estate in general, where um, we want more of it mm -hmm. and maybe more of it would even be the key to easing inflation. And yet higher rates seem to be one constraint on the creation of new units. How does that Certainly. play out in your world? Yes, uh, that is, it's a deal killer. I mean, <laughs> if, um, I mean, the, the environment that we've been in um, has put a massive constraint on commercial real estate. Mm. Um, and there's just no mistaking that. Um, what do you mean? You, so talk walk through specifically. What is what what's what's changed or so what's that constraint? It could, look it like? could say that um, for instance, your your um your your in terms of financing, your, yeah. your spread over LIBOR, what it was or now SOFR, um, which a lot of loans are. <clears throat> and originally, call it twenty twenty one, going even back to twenty twenty, I remember closing a loan um, February twenty third of twenty twenty. And at that time, LIBOR was 0 0.11. Yeah. 0 0.11, um, which is incredible. Um, now, you know, LIBOR is well over five. Yeah. Um, that, you know, 500 basis points difference is tacked on because you're going to have to pay whatever the LIBOR is plus your spread to the lender. Yeah. So instead of being in a, in a you know, call it a 4% range, now you're in a 9% range on your debt. And that it has massive impacts um, on, on the interest that you pay on the money that you're being lent to do these projects. And it, it puts so much of a, uh, a downward force on it that it really makes it so that a lot of these projects are not able to be done right now. Hmm. Um, and sure, you could get uh, you know interest rate caps um, on that, but those cost quite a bit of money because they're products that, that bring your your um, risk, risk down on the interest rate, but you have to pay for that privilege. Right. And the cost of that factored into everything else just makes a lot of these um, just not viable. Can I just say, I love that you brought up the uh, benchmark lending rates because we're recording this on June 29th. Oh, tomorrow yeah. is the last ever day for LIBOR oh, yeah. getting it's published. It's yeah. tomorrow. So moment of silence. Aren't you, going for to a <laughs> Aren't you going to a LIBOR end of a- uh, It's a wake. I'm, go wake. I'm going to awake for LIBOR tonight. <laughs> That's um, great. But uh, just on this note, I mean, you've done conversions before rates got hiked. So 180 Water Street, and now you're doing 160 Water Street, I think you said. Mm -hmm. 
I take the point about financing in general is more expensive, but do you find when you're talking to investors, to lenders, that it's easier to make the argument for conversions nowadays mm. than it was maybe several years ago? It is for us. Mm. Um, if you have a track record, you have the experience, you have the know-how, we know, like I said, you could walk into a building within a first hour or two. Yeah. Know. It, it is easier to communicate that now because this is um, much more of a headline. And thanks to you and everyone else and bringing this to the forefront, um, it, it allows us to, to really tell that story a little bit easier um, and, and give our investors a little bit of a glimpse of some of the expertise that we have um, so that they can be more uh, rest assured that we have the know-how to do this and execute on this. You know, as you talked about, like New York has, uh, for as much as there are problems here in New York still, it's done a lot better. And no one really knows like what the final like equilibrium is gonna be, right? Like it is still to right. this day, like improving little by little and you can look at MTA ridership and it's still ticking up modestly, yeah. et cetera. How much does the uncertainty um, of what the sort of like ultimate stable equilibrium yeah. sort of affect the willingness of building owners to even come to you for that first call? Cause they don't know, like they might have some guess that's like, well, maybe we're gonna be at 50, maybe we're gonna be at 70, maybe it'll go back to 90 in two years. And how much is that sort of like those estimates for what that final destination gonna be sort of impacting whether to even go down the road on a particular site? I think it's it's uh, it's different for different building owners. Okay. You have some of these um, family offices that um, have been investing in real estate for generations, and they hold various buildings, and and they can hold, continue to hold mm. without doing anything, because um, they're going to hold through this cycle and the next cycle, and so on and so forth. So they're not necessarily feeling the pressures as other building owners who really have a certain exit date that they have in mind. Um, and if they're not creating that value or if their value has gone away from that investment, um, they need to figure that plan out um, and do it quickly. Um, so I, I'd say mm. it's, it's different um, depending upon the investor. Here's a question we probably should have asked at the beginning, a really basic one, but who makes the decision to actually convert an office building to residential? Is it developers will approach a building owner with a plan mm. or the building owner will tap people like you to explore those options? How does that process actually work? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, so we, the buildings that we own, we, we always, even prior to acquisition, we're always evalu evaluating the various scenarios um, where 160 Water, for instance, we bought in 2014. We knew the ability to be able to convert it, but that wasn't necessarily plan A. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're always evalu evaluating it, and especially with our own assets. Um, other owners um, call us because they know we're in the space and they know we have a certain expertise. Um, but you know, there are developers that also go out to different building owners. Um, and say, look, I think your building is uh, a prime candidate uh, for this. We've had numerous discussions with other building owners just like ourselves, but th they don't necessarily have our expertise. And so we go to them and say, hey, look, this is, um, this is a prime candidate for this. Here are the potentials. Um, and we look at whether or not we could do a deal with them where we come in on the equity side um, or if we just are there to uh, assist on the conversion. It does sound like um, that know-how is really difficult to like from day one. Like if Tracy and I were to say, oh, I want to get into this, like replicating that would be would be one of the challenging parts, like building up that network of contractors yes. and architects and people whose job it is to escort glass across the Spanish <laughs> countryside. Or look for generator parts. Yeah, generator yes, parts. Exactly. It is. It, it really is. And you get down into the, the kind of nuts and bolts of it in terms of the building and how you do these things, and especially office buildings where you have like a structural steel, we call it a structural steel and metal deck, metal deck with concrete on top, um, where you're carving out residences, but you know, you're also reinforcing the structure with more steel. Mm. And you have to make sure that plumbing risers or duct work um, or electrical risers miss that steel. And, and you can't hit that, but then you also have to have certain dimensions that are held within the apartment itself um, for code. And so 
putting all those together is like one big puzzle. Um, and at the end of the day, needing to have a unit that is desirable and marketable. Um, so it's a pretty big challenge overall. Mm. Uh, you know, to Joe's question about uncertainty over the outlook, I, I gather there are a lot of different moving parts here, but what's your base case mm. for say yeah. in 10 or 20 years? What is New York going to look like? Are we going to be walking down, you know, Lexington Avenue? We're going to have lots more large apartment buildings versus empty office buildings. Uh, I, I think that um, I think that it's unmistakable that there will be more residential. Um, people still obviously want to be here, and they love this city. It's incredible, um, and so I think there will be more a more residential component to it. But it's also a cycle. Um, where I think we'll add a lot more residential in this time period, but um, in, in a certain outlook, whether that's five years from now or 10 years from now, um, the office space will not necessarily come back in the exact way, but it'll be here and it'll be back. Mm. Um, there is a, a large demand for class A office space right now. Um, so, you know, the, the, the- Where's that coming are, from? So. That demand. Uh, uh, the existing um, tenant base uh, wants brand new space, state of the art space, um, and you know whether it's brand new buildings at, at um, One Vanderbilt or Hudson Yards, um, these buildings are leasing up. Hmm. So people want that office space. It's this Class B, Class C, mm -hmm. potentially mid-block office building that doesn't necessarily have a future right now. Um, you can convert some of those, but it would have to be acquired for really pennies on the dollar. Um, but th that could be the case, or it could be uh, raised to the ground, um, and then a Class A office building built. Um, so we're kind of going through that now and how that all shakes out. Um, but uh, make no mistake, I, I think that New York in general with office will be will be here. Yeah, I imagine it's the return to office argument is a lot easier to make if you're bringing people back to shiny new well, buildings I, versus I know, I always a have decrepit this, midtown tower. And I always have this conversation. I'm like, oh, a lot of people are back to the office and people are like, well, you work in a really nice office. Joe. We <laughs> right. do work in a really you nice do. office here. Uh, I mean, are there, sorry, this might be a really naive question. Class A, Class B, Class C, are these objective things or are these like you sort of know a Class A office when you see it or a Class B office when you see it? You very much know. Okay. You very much know. But it's yeah. not like there's some very bright set of like things that, oh, this is. It's not like the 1961 delineation. No, okay. no. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, just going back to support for these conversions mm. and possible tax credits or other measures, you were talking about how the cost base is really important in doing these. If, you know, New York woke up tomorrow and I guess the mayor or the governor announced some big support measure, would that immediately get factored into office building valuations in such a way that maybe it made conversions less attractive? Like, would everything suddenly be ratcheted up? No, I don't believe so. No, um, it would it would help. It would help maybe stabilize. Um, I, I would the the word I would use would be stabilize. It would mm -hmm. help stabilize okay. as opposed to increase right um there are still a lot of office buildings that are going to see uh, decreases in value those class b and class c's yeah that that um people are holding on to and they're th still thinking they're going to get a 2021 uh price mm. for that mm. um that has to work its way through the the system of sorts yeah this seems like a story that um multiple guests have told us which is that there is this sort of I just mental gap between what we can see on the screen when we look at, say, the ticker of an entity like, a, you know, like a Vernado or something like yeah. that, versus where markets are pricing or private markets, in which in which case it sounds like there's still a pretty huge bid ask spread in many of these cases. Like, has that narrowed at all? Like, do you see some movement? Have uh, sellers? I don't know. What do you see on that on that spread? We're, we're certainly starting to see some more movement. Um, and granted, I, I thought that we would have seen more movement previously, mm. <laughs> whether it's six months ago or so, but we are starting to see that movement. Um, I think a lot of um, building owners are have already come to that realization. They're at that place where they understand that value has decreased. Yeah. 
now it's more of the the lenders are needing to step in oh. and they're they're seeing the landscape and also understanding where they kind of stack up mm -hmm. um and and then that's that's kind of part of the flushing out if you will of um whether it's the the owner understanding it and then the lender and then it kind of starts to get out into the market. Just speaking of lending and I guess you know on the office Terezi, who is lending? I mean we yeah. talked about the price, but are we are you, do you go to banks? Do you yeah, go and to Yeah, has uh, the mix yeah. changed? We do. Um, the mix has changed. Uh, there are there are more people in the space. Um, we've had a, a great relationship with Brookfield. Um, Brookfield is our lender on 160 water. They they did 180 water with us. Um, they've done other deals um, where it's been a kind of a heavier redevelopment aspect to it. Um, and so they've been a, a great partner um, in this space and they understand how it works. Are banks part of this or other like private investors or private lending or any other, just in terms of the broad opportunities out there for ta finding money? Yeah, I would say it's all ends of the spectrum okay. to, to for people to fill the, the full capital stack. Um, it's, uh, it's going out and, um, whether you need to, to have a, a mezzanine piece come in, um, that might be more on the private side, mm -hmm. um, and, and alongside a traditional bank. I have a slightly weird question, but, um, do you hate the inventor of open plan offices as much as some other people seem to? Like when you walk into an office building and you just see a huge empty space, do you go, oh, why did this happen? An empty space in terms of an open oh, layout. Guess an open where one space. giant room. Yeah, one giant yeah. room. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. my understanding is there are some office buildings that might be easier to convert if they're a little bit more segmented. Halls and stuff. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So instead of um, just one floor plate that is complete mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to some cutouts yeah. and things like that. Not necessarily. It's all about the era that it was built, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion, and, and what they were going through during that time. Um, in a more modern era, you have some of these deeper floor plates because they were able to bring in HVAC um, hmm. that they didn't have in oh. 1910 or 1920, where some of the buildings in the financial district, they have some more of these curves where it brings in that natural light and air I see. because they didn't necessarily have oh, AC at the time. And so you couldn't have a deep floor plate because people would be way too far away <laughs> from a window. So really deep floor plates are in part a function of the technology available to get people heating and Correct. cooling. Correct, and it would work oh, much better for a trading floor, for instance, mm -hmm. um, to have that. Um, and, yeah. Just real quickly, um, you know, we talked about some of the architectural issues, but from a sort of like safety and code um, issue, are there like major distinctions between office and residential in terms of what needs to be changed? Um, yeah, I mean, you have uh, various um, uh, requirements in terms of whether it's the, the sprinkler and fire alarm uh, coverage um, and systems um, to egress um, and, and making sure your, your stairwells are a certain width um, and certain means of egress mm -hmm. um, in and out um, in your elevator systems. There are, there are definitely distinctions. Um, I wouldn't say one is necessarily much more you know, cumbersome than the other. It's just a, a part of the, the overall process. All right, uh, Joey uh, Clully, Van Barton Group. Thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, that, that was, was a lot really of fun. interesting. That was great, yeah. that was super interesting. Tracy, I really enjoyed that conversation. It was just sort of, I mean, I sort of obviously had an intuitive sense that it's pretty complex and I mm -hmm. found that that was like really helpful in understanding like so many different dimensions of what it takes. Yeah, and it does sort of crystallize this idea of almost a double whammy for doing these at the moment yeah. because they're expensive to do, it yeah. certainly seems like, and at the same time, the cost of financing them seems to have gone up quite significantly yeah. getting back to that capacity point. And there's still and the uncertainty and the fact that different types of buyers, it's really interesting to think about the owners of buildings that have some sort of like strict lending commitments mm -hmm. where at some point the owner can no longer say, oh, we're, we're in it for this cycle. We're, we're long term <laughs> investors. And the lender steps in and is like, yeah, that's nice. You got to sell the building because we don't want to like end well, up with zero here. The other thing is thinking back to previous cycles. I know I brought up the shopping mall analogy, yeah. but I remember people talking, Absolutely. you know, back in like 2013 or something like that about how, well, some shopping malls are doomed like you yeah. can't do much with them but there were a lot of luxury shopping malls that were doing fantastically well at yeah. that same point so it does seem like you are getting these like different performances within the sector i wish i could remember the name of the guest that we had on but it was and i feel bad that i don't it was a previous cre episode and the guest made the point mm -hmm. 
it was a previous real estate episode and the guest made the point that after 2008 2009 the money was made by like spreadsheet people and there's like well the, here's the cash flow of x or y and it was like all those people like buying oh, like yeah. um you know single family houses out in the deserts of nevada and you didn't really need to know that much about nevada or anything you just know that like yeah this looks good on paper yeah, here's how much it costs here's, here's how much what it costs I can get here's what it. i can borrow at right now i'm gonna buy a thousand houses i think i could rent them out here etc and then hearing Joey talk about like the team, and it's just intuitive, like the team of like mm. contractors and architects and people who would know how to cut a hole in a building, et cetera. Right. It's very different skills, it seems like, than like spreadsheet skills. Yes, but I would say like the spreadsheet portion yeah. of it still seems extremely important. Yeah. And there's also a huge wild card factor in there, which is is New York or yeah. the US government on a federal level going to do something on like a tax credit basis to to help get more of these done? I think it was Jim Costello was the uh, guest that we had on to oh, talk yeah, about that it. That was familiar. a really good episode. Um, but yeah, I do think like the spreadsheet stuff still seems really tricky. And then it's like, OK, well, if you cut a hole, how much are we going to get for the square footage on the for the units that have a little less natural light because they're looking into the courtyard? And so it does seem like there's a lot of uncertainty. And you asked that question, like, can you lose money? Yeah. I feel confident that if I went into New York uh, real estate, I would find a way to lose money. Like, I know it's supposed to be like <laughs> I wasn't, a sure. I wasn't no. sure which way you were no, going to go I, with I, that. I feel very confident yes. in my skills, my ability to lose to money, lose in the money New York real on real estate, estate deals. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I could pull it off. I bought my place like at the top of the market yeah. last year. So I'm doing yeah, I think, yeah, I think same. we'd be good at that part. All right. On that happy note, <laughs> shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. All right. This has been another episode of the Odd Thoughts podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen. Armin Armin and Dashiell Bennett at Dashbot. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where you can find transcripts, a blog, and a newsletter. And check out our Discord, discord.gg slash Odd Lots, where listeners are chatting 24-7 about all these topics, including a very active uh, real estate channel. And you should stream Bloomberg TV on Apple Originals, Samsung, Roku, or any of the other streaming platforms. And you can also tune in on Bloomberg TV at 10 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm.